All right, welcome into another episode of Story World. Alex, how you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. Always good to talk to you, Steve. Sweet. You too, man. You too. In this, in this podcast, this episode, we're going to be talking about Setting the mood. I feel like I should have some really swanky music playing around. You know what I'm saying? Brown chicken, brown cow. Well, well, look, we are not setting the mood for that. Not tonight, anyway. We are. That's another the mood. episode. That's another episode all together. So, uh, no, but but we're we're going to talk about the different ways. Uh, this was totally Alex's idea, and I loved it immediately. So I was like, yeah, we're we're totally doing this. Um, just about how we get in the mood, like for the different things that we're. That we're doing, be it work or, or exercise or having fun, playing or whatever. So it's going to be exciting, I think. Yeah. So, uh, of course, you know, it's Story World. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit how we get into the mood and uh, before and during our um, our writing or planning or, you know, he's working on his uh, whatever he does in, in the IT world that's above my mind. Uh, but then we're also going to kind of cross into the realm of just getting ready for the day, maybe, or exercising or different things just to kind of give you some insight on prepping the mind, which can be applied across all areas of your life. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think it'll, I think it'll be good. So this is going to be this, is this our 16th? Is this, is this number this is 16? The, this is number 16. Wow. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty crazy. cool. Uh, Too bad we only that, have topics for two more weeks. So that might be the end of the podcast after that. Well, I sure <laughs> hope not. Yeah, <laughs> I sure hope not. Um, I was just looking at our, at our stats uh, yep. today. And so whatever, which I'm not sure. Which one went live? Was it 13 or 14? I can't remember. 14, went live. 14, I think. Yep. Was it 14? Yeah. Pretty sure. So 14 went live today um, on this very day that we are, we're talking. And as, as of this point, we have over 120, probably around 130 <laughs> now. Downloads on the podcast. And excellent. Which is pretty exciting. And, uh, right? It's picking up. That's good. And I'm only 80 it of is. those views. So. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm only the other 40, so it's no problem there. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I believe it or not, it's the one podcast that I really can't like go back and listen to multiple times because it's usually too long. It's, so. It's so long to do. Um, I did for the first yeah. couple. And so actually, yeah, probably only five of those views are for me. I think I listened to the first five or so. Then I was just, eh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I've, yeah, I've gone back and listened to them, but not like multiple times or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like hearing myself talk that much. Not right? that so, much. I know that there's some people uh, who have listened to a few episodes, but definitely a thank you to everyone who's, there's a yeah. few people that I know that have listened to every single episode and that's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like you guys are enjoying it. So really appreciate that a ton. Yeah. hundred percent. Keep it up, please. Show, show your support and, uh, and share it with others because I think, uh, I think we're doing something really special and cool here. So definitely. Um, so, so th this being that, you know what, number 16, I mean, I guess there's really nothing special, but yeah, sweet number six, 16, sweet, sweet 16 or whatever, 16, yeah. um, but we figured we would do something a little fun. You yep. know, we've done some pretty heavy episodes lately, so we do something a little fun. And I think what we're going to do is kind of start out with just like a general update of life, you know, what's going on in life and, um, you know, what, what, what things are happening just to kind of, you know, every now and then we said we'd kind of chime in with some ideas of what's going on. So I think we'll probably start there. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go ahead and, uh, start. So just kind of focusing on, again, the writing and the video making side of things. So finally, um, things that might work, we've kind of gone through a couple different transition periods. So, um, a lot of that has finally calmed down. So I've been able to focus again on. Uh, really getting the writing down and the video game creating. So for my writing, um, I, I know exactly how the beginning of the book is going to go. I know exactly how the ending is going to go. And I go, and I know most of the pieces in the middle to connect it all together. Um, the only thing that I have to plan now, and it's taking a little longer than I thought, but it'll be worthwhile is, um, how the magic system works and how it's going to affect my other books because they're all going to connect in a big way. And even though this book that I'm writing is a standalone book, you, you'll be able to read it on its own and, you know, have the story begin and end. And that's that, um, it's still what I put in this one will have greater implications for down the road, what I want to write. So even though something might fit in this book, it might not necessarily make sense or fit into the grand story as a whole. So anytime I make a decision on what I want something to happen to the characters, I have to really think of it in the larger light of things so that it sets up for the future as well. Um, so, but that's going really well. And I know that 
where I see some things that I need to tie in and I haven't gotten there yet, but it's not frustrating because I know that once I do figure it out, it's going to have one of those click moments and I'm just going to go, aha, that's perfect. And it'll work. Um, so doing that and then, a, and then writing slowly, my time is divided pretty much between eh, like 50 to 75% finishing the outline. Cause I just want to get that done. And then the other 25 to 50% is, um, actually writing. Um, and then for my video game, um, programming is going strong. I've kind of put the art to the side just because actually creating the game and seeing and seeing the movements and seeing how the gameplay works is the most important part. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot to it there. I, it might be a larger undertaking than what I had thought with, uh, the skills that I want the character to have and how everything integrates. And I'm still learning the programming as I go. Um, but programming is one of those things too, where Fortunately, we'll get into this a little bit. When I start, I get real locked in and I can do quite a bit in a sitting. Um, so, um, yeah, that's going, that's going really well, um, making the progress there. Sometimes I get kind of defeated because it seems like I'm not working for it, but then I realize that, well, the character playing the character is the biggest part of the game and I've gotten a good chunk of that done. And so I guess, um, I guess that is progress. <laughs> so that's kind yeah. of my update for me. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's cool, man. That's, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, that's, you basically have like two, I mean, it's like, you're trying, like you have the full-time job and you've got a family and then you've got two like passion projects that are like hobbies, but things that you really want to turn into like real, you know, money-making things one day. And so that's pretty cool. I mean, it's a lot going on. It's exciting. And sometimes it can get overwhelming a little bit, just trying to balance out everything. But, um, I think I found a I think I found a pretty good balance. I, I always want to spend more time. I just wish I did. I just wish I could do away with sleep, Steve, but that would just solve all my problems. Oh, give me that, give me that extra six hours each day. And I would be good to go. I know. I know. I, I, it's like, I feel like in my life, I, what I'm trying to do every day is strike this balance between being Elon Musk and being like some Hawaiian guy with like, who has nothing to do, but sit around and play guitar and eat. Yeah yummy food all day right like that's yeah. my yeah. that that is sort of the the hard thing for me like i want i i love aspects of both realities and so <laughs> you know how do i how do i live into that so absolutely i i feel you so so for so for me the things that are that are going on it's really like four different four different areas i've got i've got i've got basically two and a half businesses and then i've got ministry uh, that is, that is going on. And so, um, what, what I'm doing is, of course, I've got my marketing business, um, and web marketing and web design is primarily what we do. And that's, I mean, that's going strong. Um, you know, we've got, we've got new, new clients coming in. Um, those are slower intentionally, um, new clients coming in a lot of, rec you know, new projects for, uh, for current clients, which is most of what we'd like to do is go even deeper with people who we're already working with. Um, so that's good. And, and, um, yeah, things are healthy and, and alive there. So always excited about that. Um, and then as uh, one of the other things that I like to do with that, um, and this is my half business, you might say, uh -huh. is uh, I, I started getting a lot of requests for, uh, mentorship for, for people, because I, I have a pretty unique model, um, of how I actually sell the services that we offer, which is a subscription model. So when you, when you sign up with me, it's like, it's like signing up for a subscription instead of like paying for a, you know, like thousands of dollars for a huge website. Um, you'll still end up paying thousands of dollars, but it happens <laughs> over the course yeah. of, of, of time. And, uh, what that's allowed me to do is build a really stable business. And so people would be asking, well, like, could you do this for me? Uh, could, or, or could you help me? Like, what did you do? Could you give me your, your tips, your tricks or your whatever? And so finally I decided to put together a mentorship program. Um, and, and I'm, I'm trying very hard not to like make it into its own business entity. It doesn't really deserve that level of time or attention yet. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of treating it. I mean, it's got its own separate web domain and everything subscription web design.com, but I am trying to keep that, um, somewhat related as a, sort of an offshoot, right. Of the current business. Um, and so there's this, so the current business has, has really three sorts of angles. It's got the web design angle. It's got the marketing angle. Those are both client facing. And then it's got the mentorship angle to help teach other people do what we've been able, um, to do. 
And so that's a, it's really exciting. I've got three people um, who are sort of in that right now and uh, looking, looking to add more, but not that many more. I mean, I would love to start with a basic group of five to 10 for the next few months and see how that goes. So cool. had a great call the other night on that. And um, it would, yeah, it was, so it's really fun, really a, a neat thing to get to do. And uh, so if you're, if you're out there listening and you want to get into the web design business and you want to find a way to do it without, you know, trying to charge people thousands of dollars, maybe you don't have the confidence to do that. Come hit me up subscriptionwebdesign.com and I'll show you how to do it. Um, so that's that. And then the other business, um, I think I'm this, I think, I think I am going to talk about it publicly for the first time right now. Um, really? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this. Yes. I'm going to go there. You got um, the green light. Here's why. Um, because as of today, the day that we're recording this, we set up, uh, we got our LLC all squared away. We got the business is that actually, we got an EIN number. We got the only thing we don't have is the bank account. That's only because the bank was being stupid and wouldn't let us make it yet. Hmm. Um, um, online for some, yeah. I don't know what was going on. It might've been a tech glitch, but, uh, yeah. we're going to try and get tomorrow. Um, but everything's ready. To, everything's ready to go. We're planning to uh to launch so i don't know exactly when this episode is going to go live probably a couple weeks but but we are planning to launch the first of may so lord willing that it was happening that is exciting because now i'm talking about it yes um so uh anyway the, real quick the business is called buydemotracks.com and um we are uh, doing a bunch of things but the basic idea of it is we're connecting songwriters with recording artists and giving everybody a bunch of options for how to find new music and how to submit their music that they're writing to help make use of their demo tracks that they have laying around. And of course, if they need a demo for a song they've wrote, we can facilitate actually getting that created as well. And um, it's really exciting. We're, we're mainly launching in the bluegrass, southern, and country gospel niches just because that's where me and uh, my partner are um that situated right that just happens to be our situation uh but we have a lot of contacts as well sort of in the um in the country space and so we think sort of a natural transition from where we are now will be into a more mainstream country but that's definitely yeah. down the road so um it's exciting so that's, that's where great. yes it is it's, it's very exciting it's a lot going on it's probably not so crazy which is exactly why like yeah, say, that's not crazy <laughs> I, I, I literally, right. Like I, I quit my job and I started this, my, you know, my business and I did all this to, to gain freedom and control over my lifestyle, which is correct at the same time. Right. I've got this Elon Musk thing going on where it's like, I, I need to be, you know, part of, part of me living into that freedom is actually mm -hmm. doing these sorts of things. Right. So, um, and then lastly, I'll just say ministry has been great. I'm um, having some more and more opportunities to get to teach in church and stuff, which is fantastic. The podcast is going well, trying to, trying to get that integrated into YouTube a little bit more as well as this podcast getting into YouTube, um, which is, which again, just, it's a work in progress, but we're getting there. So yeah. Uh, so that's kind of everything that is going on. I'm, I'm really excited about it and, um, it's a great time to be alive. So Awesome. Good update, Steve. I'm really excited yeah. about your new business there. I really oh, excited man. to see how it goes. Me too. I hope it, I, I hope, I hope for, don't up. let me down, Steve. Don't let me down. I, I will, I will try not to. Fortunately, fortunately I have some help with this one, which is I'm not used to, right? I've, I've, I've always You're done right. things on my own. This is, this is, um, you know, this is new for me, so it's, it's going to be good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Hey, let's yeah. get started then on tonight's episode, setting the mood. 100%. Um, Steve, why don't you take us away with, uh, your, your daily ritual? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is a work in progress. I, I use what's called the full focus planner from, um, it used to be Michael Hyatt and company. He would be a pretty well-known name in sort of productivity, leadership, personal development circles, um, especially among Christians. Cause that tends to be, uh, one of the niches that he is, is known for being in. And, um, his full focus planner sort of takes elements of two courses slash books that have um, been a part of their offering. By the way, they're now called Full Focus. Um, so, so fullfocus.co is the web address. And so the, the company name has changed to sort of focus on a more corporate level structure. But um, the, 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 the two courses are best year ever and free to focus. And if you don't have the money to go get the courses, go to Amazon and buy the books. They're both fantastic books. And so this planner that I use, the, the, the full focus planner, um, 
integrates both of those, um, you know, ways of doing things together. And one of the things that they have is daily rituals. And so it's the morning ritual, workday startup ritual, workday shutdown ritual, and evening ritual, just to help situate your mind on the different things. And so I've gone through different versions of these over the years. What it currently does, what it currently looks like for me is, is, is something pretty simple. And um, I'm going to kind of lay out what it is, and then I'll give you one cool little thing at the end that might surprise you, and then I'll let you take it away. You so certainly don't sleep. Is that the secret? That's exactly right. Yes. I'm a <laughs> robot. Uh, if you tear my skin away, uh, no. Uh, German nature, right? right. Uh, terrible <laughs> time. Anyway, mixing <laughs> analogies there. Yes. So um, um, fantastic. So my morning ritual is pretty basic at this point, exercise and shower. Full disclosure, exercise is a new one on there for me. Um, I was I was really good in the rhythm of exercising in the morning before I moved to this house two or three years ago now, and uh, because I had a good space to do it. And once we moved here, I just never really got back into the ritual. And now um, I'm trying to really make some strides towards my weight again, uh, both from the diet and exercise perspective by June, um, and of course beyond. But I'm setting a small goal for myself right now. So trying to get through June for sure, closing my Apple Watch activity rings nice. uh, every day. And staying within a two meal a day, one meal a day, um, keto sort of diet structure. So exercise and shower um, in the morning to get me going pretty much before anything else. Um, my workday startup ritual is dwell and steward. Okay, so so by dwell, this is my prayer and Bible time. I actually use the dwell app, which is a great um, audio Bible app that also like you can scroll, you can swipe over and it'll give you um like the um the verses and, and it like it it walks you down like it actually mm -hmm. reads them along with you a very very helpful tool and of course the whole point is that it helps you to dwell so there is music in the background you can sort of select that you can choose the voice in the bible that makes the most sense for you you can even put it in a repeat mode to help with memorization so fantastic yeah. app i pay for it like 40 dollars a year i think um and so that and then a time of prayer that's my dwell um, for Steward, I, uh, I basically check YNAB, which is my budgeting software that I'm a raving fan of, um, every morning and just kind of reconcile things and make sure that everything looks, looks nice and tidy and not getting too out of hand. Um, then, so my workday shutdown ritual is to learn and reflect. So, um, I, I, it, it so to put those two together, they're, cause they're kind of the same. Um, I, I mentioned, I think on the last time we recorded, I mentioned the Zettelkasten system of, of note-taking. So I'm really trying to incorporate that into my daily life. And so the reflect is basically every day I'm keeping a journal entry of just notes and various things throughout the day um, to even help me through my thinking process. And so that's on my reflection. So I need to make sure I'm, I'm constantly writing and, and sort of tackling things at that meta level throughout the day. And so if I do that, I get to place that check mark. Um, and then for learn, I'm, I'm trying to do at least 30 minutes of focused reading a day. And so I'm sort of changing how I read now based on this Zettelkasten system. I used to read, uh, I used to do a lot of reading while like driving and just swiping on my Kindle or whatever. And I, while I would still do that for, I think, leisurely and enjoyable reading, for anything that I'm trying to retain, I'm now reading with, with, Honestly, my Kindle app open on one side of my computer screen. I have an ultra wide monitor um, and my, my, my note taking app on the other side of the computer screen and I'm reading and taking notes and putting things into my own words while I'm reading and then synthesizing those things into larger ideas to keep in my permanent note system um, like I described last week. So that's my workday shutdown is at the end of the day to kind of help me make that transition into, okay, I'm out of work mindset. I'm now in family mode or whatever. I, I go ahead and try to work in some reading and some reflection time in there to kind of put a clean break. They also say that reading helps you lower stress, lower anxiety and all of this. Um, and so I think what, a, I mean, what better way to come off of the work day um, than to sort of have those things go through your mind. Uh, and then the evening ritual right now is bed. It is bed. straight up bed. I wish it was more sophisticated than that. Honestly, it's bed. Um, I mean, I fill up my CPAP machine, but you know, to help me breathe at night, but that's not very fun to talk about. So um, I, I go to bed. That's it. So that's I, my daily ritual. That's a day in the life. I figured out your ultimate 
purpose now, Steve, of the uh, the note taking and the podcasting and all that. I finally figured it out. Yeah. That what is it? You are logging your whole life and who Steve is on on your uh, in the Ethernet and in the uh, the technical world, so that one day when your flesh withers away, they'll just pick up your brain, put it in a computer, and you know, load up everything that you have downloaded, and boom, and you just live on forever. You know, you that's know what that. It's be. That is the secret. In all honesty, I mean, obviously, that's not the, the particular thought. Uh, but I am fascinated, right, by this idea of building a body of work that's sort of like, like I'm just thinking about, so I lost my dad to cancer, um, technically to pneumonia, but, but you know, ultimately to cancer. Um, at He was 38. So I'm 32 now. So he was 38 when he died. And I, I, for one, that's like, whoa, that's unreal. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I did have, so like the, the concept of a web blog was brand new back in those days when he was going through his cancer. This was late nineties, early two thousands. And so he actually did have some journal entries on this old site that's no longer that's cool. there, but, but, but my stepmom had printed them out and sent them mm -hmm. to me and I have them in storage. And so, but how cool would it be to have like, like, like if he had just Frankly, if he'd have lasted, and it sounds ter terrible to say, but if he if he had been around a little longer and kept journaling and kept logging and kept putting his thoughts out, I would have loved to be able to have that catalog oh, yeah. of stuff, you know. And so I think there's really something to that, actually, of of of, of giving. That's almost a better gift than money or anything else. If you oh, yeah, sort absolutely. of give your collect your collection of of your thoughts of your life to someone else, like. I just think that's the coolest thing. So that yeah, is I mean, a lot of content production. Unless like your parents were famous or were on a t on TV or ran a radio program or something in the, as far back as yeah. you can think of, like there, you have no history of, you've had some history with grandparents and some, mm -hmm. granted, some people did detail in journals long ago, but like your great, great grandkids, so you'll never be able to meet most likely are going to be able yep. to watch these and know exactly the kind of person you were. It's, it's very exactly. exciting. Exactly. I think it's, I think it's so cool. cool. Um, I'll give you one quick Easter egg and then please move on yes. to yours. Uh, yes. Go. And, and so that would be this is I, I, when I, when I worked these things into my daily ritual that I explained in the full focus planner, um, I had started trying to do this in something separate that I called the, um, the rule of life. So if you look up rule of life, it's an ancient, basically Christian practice that sort of helps you give a standard you know, rule of living to your, mm -hmm. to your day where you do certain practices on a regular basis. And I, I always like to come up with little frameworks and things. So I, I, I started, I, I lined out this framework that if you notice to well steward, learn and reflect, they, the acronym is DSLR. So I called this my rule of life, but I called it my daily snapshot. So like DSLR camera mm -hmm. snapshot. The problem is as cool as that is, I never really like it just never really like took hold for me. Um, I never could remember to go in and like duplicate the the template note and like keep it all up. Yeah, yeah. And so, but now that I'm sort of integrating it into my planner that I've used for three, four, I probably oh probably five or six maybe yep. years now. Um, yeah, probably five or six. Wow. Um, like now it, it's working for me because it was already yeah. doing that, and so I've just kind of structured it better. So I am. Right. I am horrible with acronyms. And to be fair, I think it's because there's too many out there. If you were like, yeah, yeah there's remember this easy acronym shovel for this management <laughs> technique. Or remember this one. <laughs> like there's there's too many. There's too many. Yeah, I, um, I, I could agree with that. At some point, you're not learning the acronym. You're just trying to keep up with the words that represent the acronyms. The only one that I've ever yeah. remembered is pass. Pull, aim, squeeze, and swipe. And pull, or, or, wait, pull, aim, squeeze. What is that for? <laughs> uh, fire extinguisher. Oh, <laughs> that's the only one I ever remembered. <laughs> well, you're into some weird stuff. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, fire. <laughs> fire. <laughs> All right. That's great. I'll All right, go for it. So, yeah. um, I'm not saying that Steve's days don't get hectic because I, I know, I know that they do. I've seen it firsthand, but my days are, um, a little bit different just because of how my setup is where I do go into an office, um, five days yeah. a week. And so, um, there is no daily set schedule that I have of getting up and then I do this, 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 and this, um, it, 
a lot of it comes down to sometimes I might have closing at work or sometimes like my running schedule. One day a week, I have a long run where I run an hour and a half and another day I have one where I run a half hour. And so my days I have to look at, I, what, what I do is I come to a week and I schedule out what my week looks like. And then just, I have to go and take it each day at a time. And so sometimes I might do my devotions when I wake up first thing in the morning. Sometimes it's in the middle of the day at work. And sometimes it's when I go to bed at night. And so every day is different for me. So really I have to look at my day into different segments and then prep myself based on when those things are going to happen. So I'll go to the first thing and that is, um, my writing. Um, so, uh, the first thing that I do is the prep work. Um, writing for me, even though I really enjoy it and I finally found, we talked about it in an earlier episode, um, pretty good methods now of, um, of writing and not getting burnt out and really, um, that my effectively, uh, effectively and efficiently writing. Um, I, it's still the one that I have to prep my mind the most for, um, it just takes the most out of me. So before I write in, I try to write typically kind of first thing in the morning and I'm usually I have to take, spend 30 to 60 minutes. 60, I usually don't have time for 60 minutes. It's usually about a half hour where I have to really think about what I'm going to be doing that morning. Um, and that's how I get in the mindset. I really have to block everything out and just think if it's outlining, that means reading what I've already outlined. Even if I'm reading it for the 50th time, I have to read and put my mind in that mentality and understand where my mindset was yesterday when I was writing that and get in that mindset. Um, same thing with writing. If I'm writing, doesn't matter what scene it is, if it's a transition scene, if it's a dialogue scene, if it's an action sequence, I have to, um, reread a little bit of it. Yes, but it's mostly picturing in my mind and getting in the mentality of this is what's happening and not just what's happening, but here is specifically what I'm going to be writing over the next hour. If I sit down, um, I feel, bur and I, and I haven't prepped my mind, I feel burned out within five or 10 minutes because I'm doing the thinking as I'm going. And yeah, some of that happens naturally anyway, but I really have to think about exactly what I'll be writing. That way, when I sit down, I know exactly what I'll be doing. So that prep work is absolutely necessary, um, for me to do that. Um, um, also another thing too, that, um, that really helps is especially when it comes to character building, um, outlining and really designing the world, not necessarily thinking about the actual writing, but, um, picturing ex what my book is about and all of that it comprises it. I have to kind of keep that in my mind throughout the day. Um, just kind of, you know, whether I'm mowing the lawn, that's actually a good opportunity or driving. Um, even if I'm not really detailed planning in my head, just kind of thinking about what I've already written it just generally keeping that in the forefront. So for my writing, I, I can't forget about it. It always kind of has to be there and I have to, I have to sit there and purposely think about, um, what I've written and where I'm at in my book. Um, it's very important to that. If I get out of it just a little bit, it, um, it really messes me up and I have to kind of readjust and realign my thinking for it. So that's kind of how I prep for once I get into the writing now while I'm writing, um, to kind of set the mood, if you will. Um, I used to listen to music while I wrote, I realized that I can't do that anymore. Um, I enjoy music too much and I just, I get caught up in the lyrics or even if it's a instrumental thing, um, I just, I can't do it. I have to just not listen to music. If for some reason I do, it has to be something random that I I'm not familiar with so that I can't like get into it. And it just is kind of background noise, but I find myself mostly recently is I focus better when I'm not listening to music. Um, nothing's going on. There's no background. It's just focusing on my book. Um, and it's so just... like, uh, so, okay. That <laughs> this feels really weird for me, I guess, because I'm used to having like lots of kids running around, um, or whatever, but like, I can't. Um, I, I, I guess I just can't imagine pure silence. And it seems to me like if anything was going on, I would just immediately <laughs> like get, get distracted or start like thinking about whatever that, whatever that thing, um, was, do you never, I mean, like, are you able to actually focus with no, with nothing drowning out external noise? Like just in actual silence, you can think yeah. about things. That's awesome. Yeah. It's funny. Cause it's, um, when I get into it about my video game, it's complete opposite when I make my video game, but yeah, for writing, 
um, it actually, yeah, inhibits my oh, yeah. writing when, when, when I'm writing, if, again, like I said, if I'm listening to music, it, it, when I'm writing, I, I have to focus. I know that even though it's a creative process, I can't be willy nilly with it. I really have to, it's almost like taking like, like a test, um, in school, like, or you know how if people make fun of it, but it's true. Like if you're driving in a city or a place, you don't know, you turn down the music on the radio because you need to focus on where you are. It's just, my senses have to be tuned into what I am writing. It has to be like that. <laughs> So, yeah, I love the memes about that online. Like that makes no sense, right? Like lost yeah. <laughs> since we turn on music, but we all do it. I mean, I I definitely oh, do it. Well, I mean, your senses are, you know, if your senses are separated somewhere else, then you know they then they're not aligned. Um, yeah, yeah, and then, exactly. And so the last thing to kind of add to that is I write in like one to two hour segments. I really try to write two hours at a time because um, it takes a little bit to get into a rhythm. But um, sometimes, yeah, I will do. I will do an hour, um, especially if I'm in the process of still figuring out things. Cause then I, I do tend to get burnt out if my mind is just constantly going and going, going and grinding through it. Um, but yes, um, one thing that really helps in my writing is if I don't do it first thing in the morning, like very first thing, then I kind of have to wait until everything else is done during the day. So I have to make sure that all my work is, done. if I get up and do it in the morning, then I'm fine. I get focused. But if I try to do it like mid morning and I have other stuff going on, I can't do it. Cause I'm the other stuff is just bombarded me. Like, oh, you didn't answer this email. Oh, you didn't do that. You didn't do this. And so I either have to do it first thing in the morning or get everything else done in the day and then do it. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. No. That's fascinating. That's cool. how I prep for the writing. Very good. Um, okay. Well, uh, since, uh, my, yeah, next up for me is writing as well. So I think Perfect. that makes sense. Let's see how odd you are, Steve. Go ahead and dive into it. Well, probably not, probably not that odd. Uh, also not that detailed. Now, to be fair, um, again, mostly I'm writing nonfiction, mostly, you know, you're writing fiction, um, maybe even exclusively those two things. Right. So, um, so I, I don't know what it would take for me if I was doing, right. If I was trying to write fiction, it, it does seem to me, I think you had, you had mentioned something about really having to have it on your mind a lot, like throughout the day and like be thinking about yeah. it. I think that would be so true for me if I were trying to write fiction. Like, I think I would just have to constantly be dwelling on it. In fact, I don't, I, I'm not sure that I can imagine like trying to split up the brain space with everything I have right now and being a fiction writer. So how are you doing? Why, um, why, I mean, you probably won't be able to interested until you try writing fiction, but why do you think that you don't have to keep that on the forefront of your brain with nonfiction? Um, I, well, to be honest, I, it's not that I don't have to, it's that I think it, I just do. I think it just is. Um, because I, I am, I am constantly in either content production mode, prep for content production mode, or noticing for content production mode. Because I, in general, I, I see myself as a producer and not really a consumer, right? Yeah. So I, I sort of pride myself on being someone who almost by default will share ideas because that's how society advances. And so I, I just want to identify as one of those people. So you know, it's like throughout the week, I'll write down, like I'm gonna do a story of the week today. And, you know, you will too, but for me, it's like, I actually keep a note full of those. And so I, I can go back and, and pull from that. You know, when I, on Thursday morning, when I wake up to record podcasts, I have, a, I have notes with hundreds of ideas in them for the different things that I've collected. And so it's almost like a kid in a candy store. I get to sort of wake up and like, oh, what are we going to talk about, you know, today? So it's just, I think it just is always on my mind. Not necessarily that particular subject matter though because again like i think all of the things are are i will say this though now that you got me thinking now um when i'm actually going to sit down and like write my book um i tend and this is maybe fascinating i tend to go through spurts like phases and i i almost i almost think even though it bucks up against so much of what i've been taught and what i've thought about I, I i'm starting to become more okay with this that like i may not work on my on my books for weeks maybe even months at a time because there's just so much going on but then i'll get like i'll get i'll go through a phase where i'm like i'm reading very consistently or maybe i'm reading um in in 
a similar space to where my book is, like like again, reading about theology or something like that, and it'll just give me the hankering. It'll give me the hankering, and then I'll have a couple a couple days or maybe a week where I put focused attention on it, and then it sort of drifts into the background for a little while, and that's and that's okay. So I think maybe that's how it works for me is I get inspired by something um, that helps me continue. So me. Um, yeah, so so I guess along those lines, you know, as far as prepping for writing, um, sometimes I will intentionally beforehand read authors who inspire me either based on the kind of content that's being created or um, or stylistically. And so uh, one of the best examples of this is Greg Kokel, who I've mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I love what he talks about. The subject matter is fantastic. And I love the way he writes. And so sometimes I will get a little bit of his writing into my, you know, in, into my brain and into my, you know, I, I will consume that um, before I will take to actually writing on my own. And what's funny about this is that that he actually does this with somebody else. Um, so there's a guy named Greg Gansel, who is a philosopher at uh, Biola University. At least I think he's at Biola. Um, if he's not, he used to be. But he is a good writer. And what Greg has before mentioned is that he will go read some of his books before he sits down to write. So it's kind of being passed on. Um, um, yeah. And and so there's just a, it's stylistically, um, I like to kind of be, um, inspired, uh, before I, because I want to be, I want to write clearly in, in a particular way. Um, next I will prepare any notes that I, that I have taken. Um, Again, with this new way of of taking notes on on things that I'm reading and, and listening to and engaging with, I am seeing I am I am intentionally starting to see a shift in the way that I go to the writing, and, and so I and I'm, to be honest, I'm expecting this to come up even more as I get more into this new way of of of, th- of being intentional about taking notes and 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 capturing ideas based on what I'm learning. Um, I'm, it's definitely going to be going forward more of writing based on what I have written previously in my notes um, and, and, and sort of refining ideas that are already written versus now the way I write is mostly blinking cursor, stream of consciousness, yep. you know, whatever. And that works for me still because I'm, I'm typically able to um, – then either either just based on the learning I have been doing, you know, I'll get into the zone and I can sort of recall things with my memory. Um, but what I don't like about this is that I will often find myself having to look things up um, a lot. Frankly, Google things. And, and, and it's not just because, oh, I'm trying to like learn it as I go. That's not the point. It's that I have maybe about 30 to 40, 45 percent i'm making it up but you know 30 to 45 percent of the idea in my mind and i might need to to do a little bit of research to get the specifics of it down and so um i in the past i had never really separated research from writing i sort of researched while writing um whereas now i'm trying to do that differently and sort of separate the research from the writing a little bit so when i by the time i come to write i sort of want to have the ideas thought through already and then I'm just writing and refining them in the writing process. So definitely a big, a big difference. Um, and then I also wrote down contextualization. And what I mean by that is what you said about, about like, I'll have to back up. I'll zoom out and read. You know, if I'm working in a chapter, I'll for sure start at the beginning of that chapter and read down to that point to get the logical flow of thought. Um, if it is, like I mentioned, where I'm going weeks or even months in between returning to the book, I'll, I'll, I'll probably read a couple chapters of what I wrote before I start writing anything new to really get in the zone on that. Gotcha. Um, contra to the way you do it, I most definitely crank up a movie score or some other sort of inspiring soundtrack. It is usually going to be instrumental um, because I, I do find it hard to focus mm-hmm. with words of any kind. I know some people who actually do their writing and production while like, listening to podcasts and listening to like preaching and stuff like that. I'm just like, I don't. Yeah, definitely I with do words it. like that. Yeah, I can't. 
I cannot do that. I don't know how anybody does that. Now, um, with you, who actually is a musician, when you're listening to something instrumental, do you find yourself drifting off into that too, and like picturing um just playing playing the music, or not really? Um, um, not not characteristically. No. Um, sometimes I will find myself like extra enjoying it, you know, and I and, I, and then I'll get curious. Oh, who is this? What is this, <laughs> you know, what is this score yeah. from, you know, or just whatever. And so yeah, sometimes I get, yeah. So sometimes I'll get distracted in that way, um, for sure. But most of the time it's not like that. Um, and, and yeah. when I find like, I have Apple music and, you know, you can find playlists that are actually even designed to help you focus. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah, there, yeah. There's even a service called, um, um, I forget what it's called. Um, but it's something to do with focus. And, um, the, the service it's, it's like scientific, it's, it's actually pretty cool. It's like $10 a month or something, but it's, it's music that is scientifically engineered to help you focus for different sorts of moods and activities. So, hmm. um, anyway, so it's, it's, it's kind of neat. Um, and then, uh, the last thing for me on writing is that I'll like to use tools and different videos or whatever, just things to find inspiration, um, as needed. I mentioned before, sometimes I like to do my writing in Jasper.ai, which is a AI, um, writing assistant that sort of helps you, you know, pull ideas from across the, the database that is the World Wide web and, and help you generate ideas for which to, um, uh, write on and, and think about or, or create content around. Um, and the ideas are still, you know, I mean, originally yours, ultimately, I mean, unless you just totally plagiarize or whatever, but yeah. you can definitely use a tool like this to help get the juices flowing. So sometimes I do that and, uh, and sometimes not. So that's, that's that. That's writing for me. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah. He's writing sure. process. Um, yeah. so my next, uh, my next kind of topic on how I prep for is for, um, when I work on my video game. And yeah, it's weird. It's the, um, it's the exact opposite for my writing for my writing. I have to be, um, I get serious and focused. Um, I, I just, I have to be, you know, like no nonsense about it, but for my video game, and it doesn't matter if it's on the more creative side for doing the art or if it's more technical and I'm doing the, the programming for it, but I have to be like, really like loose with it. Um. And it's, it's so much easier for me to get into, um, working on my video game. Uh, it's more, it's less press work, less prep work and more do work. And so essentially, uh, I don't know. So before, before I work on my video game, no matter what it is, uh, I'll usually, um, it's usually like a YouTube video. I'll watch a video of it. Typically it's a, I, I'm a big fan of metal music. So it'll be like a metal song that I've been really listening to a lot lately and I'll just really get into it and, you know, just let myself go and just get into the mode of it. And then, uh, for some reason, I don't know why this song in particular, but there's a song called Dune by bring me the horizon. They're a metal band and I listen to their live performance and it has an orchestra with it. And it just like, I don't know, it just, it gets me ready and it gets me pumped up and zoned in. And then once that's done, I, I go, okay, I'm ready now. So. I will put on the, the thing that's important for me is again, e even if it's programming that involves a little bit more thinking, um, I have to stay loose while I'm making my video games. So that usually involves me putting on a album, it typically a, a, a metal album, and I will take the time even in the middle of, uh, my programming to, if a, like a really hard, um, really hard breakdown happens in the middle, I will, I'll go ahead and and, you know, bang my head to it and take the time and get into it for like 30 seconds and then immediately go back into the programming. I, I can't do that when I write, I would just lose focus. But for some reason, even if I'm programming and I'm, I'm really focusing on the structure of my code, I can do that and take that little break and get right back into it and just feel like really alive for it. So it's, it's a whole different setup from the writing. And I've thought about why that is, I think it's because with the video game. For my writing, even though I can picture the scene and what wants to happen, I, there's so much thinking involved with, okay, what are the repercussions if this scene is set up this way for down the road? And it, it just involves a lot more detailed planning, not to say that video game doesn't have planning, but 
and, and for the writing, just the exact words that you want to use to come across a point in thinking about your sentence structure and if that should change for certain areas. But for the video game, I just, I picture what I want the character to do. And even though I'm still learning code and learning the specific language of it, I base, I generally know the process of how to get where I need to go. And so as far as that, like the thinking's done, like I know what I need to do and then it's just a matter of doing it. And so staying like loose and with it really helps me with that. Now, the only exception for that is if I get stuck in my programming and I come across a problem that I just don't know how to fix or solve or what's wrong, I have to shut off all the music and I go into kind of like that, that writing mode where I have to zone in and focus and get really serious and, you know, figure out what the problem is. But other than that, yeah, it's, it's totally opposite from the writing and, um, it's worked. And I, just to kind of add to that, um, it, I, before, especially with my writing, I would always kind of listen to how other authors got into the writing mentality and what they would do and how long they would write and, you know, how they would prep for it. And I, I mean, we're all so different. And I mean, and even with me, how I'm the same person, no matter what, just two different areas of my life that I'm working on, I prep and get into it totally differently. And so for anyone who, whether it's your work or, um, your writing or riding a bike or whatever you want to do, there's no wrong way to prep for something like your mind functions different totally from someone else's and it's, um, so yeah, just go with whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah. That's really good advice. Right. I mean, this is like, like, like we said at the beginning, this is almost more, more of a fun thing, like to, you know, to get into how to, you know, just, just to, how does somebody else do it? Right. Cause it's kind of fun to get an eye, you know, yeah. an eye into that versus like, this is not like, oh, you should definitely do it this way. Um, if you can come away from this with just one idea to, to help make your day a little better, or at least maybe a little different then I think we'll have, well, you know, we'll have that our job. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's it for me on, uh, we're on the video game. Sweet. So, so my next one's going to be quick, uh, real quick. Um, it's just, uh, my workout sort of routine and, and really nothing too special here. Um, I try to do what's called activation triggers, which just, it's a concept actually I got from Michael Hyatt. Um, who invented my planner that I use. And um, the, the the basic idea of it is, is that for anything that it might be sort of hard to do to get into the habit of, if you could sort of create an environment where that habit can naturally sort of form, um, then it will be easier to do. So for example, if, if you have to exercise, you know, if your plan is to exercise in the morning, it would create a lot of friction to have to go like pick out an exercise shirt, pick out an exercise, you know, sort, you know, find your, find your socks, find your, um, your shoes, like do all those things. Um, versus if they're all laid out right there on your dresser, you can just wake up, hop up first thing, put on your shoes and your clothes ready to go. And now that's not an obstacle that's preventing you from getting started and, and causing mental battles. So there are little things like that that you can do that sort of trick your mind into, um, you know, preparation for things. So anyway, that that's that's an idea um, that I think will help if you if you implement it across different domains of your life. Um, stretches, pretty simple. <laughs> I mean, I'm I I right. I have a lot of uh, I still have a lot of weight to lose. I still have my joints and everything. Like and so for me, if I don't do at least some stretching uh, before I start to get into my workout and stuff, it I'm, I'm feeling pretty brittle. Not gonna lie. So um, that's important. And then the the main like meat of my workout routine now is uh, is Apple Fitness Plus. And, and frankly, they've just helped to do the job of. It's almost like another activation trigger in a way because I don't have to think about, oh, like I'm going to have to Google a new exercise to do tomorrow. I'm going to have to, you know, oh, do I want to do legs? Do I want to do my treadmill? Do I want to do whatever? You know, I mean, yeah, I have to make the decision at some point because like not all the exercises are the same. At the same time, it's all right there for you in this one system. It's, it's a consistent process. And at the end of the day, every workout that you do, like, like the goal is for that day, to close your rings. So there's like one definable goal on the Apple watch, you know, that, that you can do for these workouts. And, um, it, and, and it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, if you get most for most people, and that's why it's set the way it is by default, but for most people, if you get 30 exercise minutes in actual, like full exercise minutes in 
a day, that's that's really good and a lot more than what most people are doing. You can set the goals, you know, higher or lower or whatever, but that's a that's the kind of the minimum bar around 30 minutes a day of good exercise um, will, in, you know, generally speaking, can help lead to a very healthy life as long as you're eating right and things like that. So I like I like that there's a simple goal with Apple Fitness Plus, and I like that um, it is a simple and um, very tailored experience that just takes all the guesswork out of it and frankly makes it real easy to do. So that's my cool. workout routine. Awesome. That's cool, Steve. Um, to since uh, I'll, I'll kind of switch up mine since you talked about exercising, I'll go into my running. Um, so uh, the main thing is, uh, so the, a couple of reasons why I got into running. One was for health, but th that wasn't, for the health reasons, it wasn't motivation enough for me to to do it because I tried that before. I just never got into mm -hmm. it. I just quit. So yeah. for me, it's the competition side of it where I want to try to be the best possible runner that I can be. I was always, I would say I was decent in high school. Um, I was never great, but I definitely wasn't bad. And I didn't really try too much. I didn't focus on what I ate in high school. So when I started getting into running last summer, I thought, well, um, let's just see actually how good I can be if I actually give it my all. Um, that's hard sometimes. I just, the eating habits and staying with it consistently. But so that follows a lot of prep work. I guess you can call it prep work just to begin with, with making sure that I'm eating things at the right time, that I'm eating things for the right season of running and each day. Um, I'm not, definitely not a genius when it comes to that stuff. I have to rely on learning every single day and week about how to best balance my nutrition. But so that goes into a lot of prep work there, but immediately before the run, of course, is stretching that kind of goes without saying, um, but for, to get in the right mindset, I, I have to picture myself like on race day or else I don't get that motivation to go again. It's not about me getting out there and burning the calories or, um, how many steps I take. I, it really is for me is the more that I run and the more that I stick to this plan, then the better I'm going to do in that 5k or that half marathon. And so I always have to look for it that way. Um, during the run, um, again, a little, maybe a little different from some people, but, um, this part might not be different, but the first three miles, um, always just absolutely suck. I, I, I hate it. And some people like, oh, no, like you, it's fun driving through it, but I, I hate it. The first, first three miles, I actually like, I'm like, why am I doing this? This is awful. It sucks. And I, my body just feels like crap. Once I get over that hump, if it's a longer run or just even a normal run. Um, then I feel great and I just feel like I can't stop and keep, and I just keep going and going and going. But that first part sucks and how I get over it is by berating myself to, to no end. So I will say like, wow, I actually like really do suck at this, don't you? And I will just beat myself <laughs> up so hard and just make it so that I am like the worst person on earth. And I don't, that just helps me get through it. And yeah, yeah. well, let me just come in, come in on that and say, that's another reason why i like apple fitness plus right because it's, it's all guided right i mean you're mm -hmm. you're you know you're working with trainers um and it's it and one of the things that helped me is and i know that it's like i know this is true but like like when you're when you're 30 minutes into a 45 minute treadmill workout and you're really starting to feel the burn of constantly cycling up and down of hills and speed pushes and things like that um to hear somebody say it means a lot and that is this um a lot of times your, your body is able to do incredible things. Even, even when you're a, he a little bit heavier, like I am, you know, right now I'm like 230, 233, 234 right now. And for my, for my height, I really need to be like 185, 190. So I have a little ways to go. Um, but, uh, it, my body is fine to do it. It's, it's, it's honestly more yeah. your mind. And so Absolutely. really. So for me, the way that I push through that, because I'm the same way, I, my, my old boss used to say that for him, running felt like eating a candy bar. And I thought, well, you probably have other mental problems too. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's like, what, what for me, it's definitely not that way. But the way that I get through it, yeah, a little bit of, of self, you know, beratement or whatever, like that's probably there too. Um, but But it's also just a lot of trying to separate mind from body. And thinking like, yeah, I mean, maybe it's willpower or whatever, but yeah, it's like, it's like my body can do this. I, so shut up, you know, mind. And then, yeah, usually by the end of the workout, I, I could keep going. Um, <laughs> it's feeling really good. So one thing that helps too, and this is every area of life, but finding like a running buddy or a running group, I don't have a running group just with like my time constraint. I just run outside my house, but 
like a week or so ago, mm -hmm. I ran with um, our, um, I guess, associate pastors is title at our church. And we went to the state park next to us and we ran five and a half miles, I think. And it was yeah. trail running, which I wasn't used to. And it was one of the easiest runs I've done because we just talked the whole time. It was a slightly lighter run, but we still kind of pushed ourselves, but it was great because I had someone to run with. And so you're just naturally pushing yourself with someone else. But even when I'm not running with someone, um, I have Strava, the running app. And so I um, yeah. see how good like people are, are, are doing on there. And it just kind of motivates you to do that. I also have a, uh, a buddy, an old friend who lives in Boston. He just, he crushes running. He's been doing it his whole life. He just ran the Boston marathon, did it in under 250. Um, so he just, he's an awesome runner. And so that's good motivation there for sure. Yeah. Well, um, we should go, we should go for a run sometime. I didn't really think about that. I'm like getting into it. this like tread. Yeah. Tre I mean, I've been doing it right on the treadmill, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that sounds awesome. I'm, I'm we dead. definitely need to do it. Absolutely. You'll just it's go, a lot. go easy on me. <laughs> uh, you go easy on me, Steve. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, uh, that, that's just kind of, oh, another thing too, with running is, um, I, I can't listen to music when I run either. Um, I think for, no way. <laughs> yeah, so two reasons, one I've had, I've never been attacked by a dog, but I've had too many instances, not several, but just enough instances where like dogs have run at me and like, I, I run mostly at night, whether it's late at night, early in the morning. Yeah. And like, if I would have been listening to earbuds, even if they weren't noise cancel, like I might not have heard like the dog approach. So when yeah. I hear a dog barking or running at me, I know to kind of, you know, start talking nicely to it and back away. Um, but even aside from that, um, I have to like, list. I have to focus on my breathing and my steps and like, I, I really have to tune into my running and it's the same wow. kind of music. Yeah. So, um, so you that, run in silence as well. Yeah. And wow. I, and I, that's why I typically run at night too. Cause at night there's, especially in my neighborhood, it's really quiet. There's not a lot of noise. So it's just the breathing and just the counting of that's literally all I do is I'm counting my breathing. Um, so at least what I heard again, I'm learning all this stuff still, but, um, I breathe depending on how fast I'm going and how much oxygen I need, I, or just the pacing of it, I breathe in every two steps, then out every three. And you want to do odd numbers so that you're, you're balancing the strain on your lungs each time. So if you constantly do even ones that you're putting all your pressure on one side, if that's something I learned a little bit ago. And so I'm counting the breathing and in my mind, I'm just cause I like math and numbers. I'm just constantly calculating like my pace. And if I did this on race day and how much would I have to do this? And so it's, so that's what I do while, while I run. Wow. You're serious. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's the running. Fantastic. Cool. So, uh, so my next thing, um, is fun things. Now this might sound funny. Um, why do you have to prep for fun things? Um, and, and I want to put fun in quotation marks because it's, well, I don't want to say it's like not fun to like hang out with my family and stuff. That's certainly not true. But for me, um, work is like eating a candy bar, right? So to use that analogy, um, I love the things that I get to do. Now, I mean, everybody has normal frustrations with it and, you know, there's problems. It's not all fine and dandy, but, you know, broad spectrum of things. I love the team that I've built. Um, I love the work that the Lord allows me to do. And, um. I think it's a lot of fun. And so when I, when, when it's time to do other fun things, like eat with my family, hang out with my family, you know, be, be totally unplugged from work type of things. It's actually hard work um, for me, if, if I'm being honest. And so a couple of things I do to help make it easier. Number one, I pray. Literally, I pray about it. I ask God for help on this. Like, you know, Lord, allow me to focus on these things I, because these are the things that truly matter. Like the reason I wanted freedom and a lifestyle that I could control is so that I could, whatever, take a random hour or two long break during the day and do something with the kids or, you know, be able to stop working early if, or, you know, just whatever the thing is. Um, so I pray like, help me Lord to have my mind focus on the right things. Um, I'm not very good at this, but I, I, I do make an effort to put my phone um, away, usually like on the charger in another room. Um, I still have my Apple watch. If anything comes up, that is, you know, very, you know, whatever, but, um, I, I have my, all my Apple stuff goes into what's called downtime, which is a setting that you can set. So it, it, it limits the things that, that, uh, it limits certain things that I can access in terms of, um, accessing them at all it gives you the option to bypass it for 15 minutes or, or, or whatever, but then it, I do the same thing for certain apps. 
Do you really? Yeah, I, I find it very helpful. Uh, at the very least, it gives you that awareness. And I found, honestly, it's like, it's practical. The other day, I found that I was literally, okay, let's, for the sake of a simplicity, let's call that 15-minute thing snoozing, your, your downtime. Um, basically, I found myself snoozing the Facebook app. You know, whatever, right? It was like, I, I, yeah. I was constantly, you know, so I went ahead and, and I, once again, deleted Facebook from my phone. I've done this mm. various times, um, deleted it from my phone and it's been fantastic. I, I check it every now and then on the computer, but um, I encourage everyone, just a little side note, I encourage everyone to, I don't know if it's on by default or not, but turn on your screen time and your settings on your iPhone. And after yep. even just a week, about a week or two, look at that and see where you're spending your time. Um, mm -hmm. it, the first time I did that, it amazed me how much time I was spending on crap. Yeah. And it yeah. just, and so anyway, yeah. yeah, just a little helpful tidbit. You'll be, you'll be amazed yeah. at um, what you're spending your time with. And, and part of it, right. And, and, and by the way, like this is, this is marketing, right? I mean, like this is what they, these apps are literally designed mm -hmm. to do this, to keep you in them forever and ever. I mean, that's what they want. They don't want you to leave. Everything about the experience is tailored billions of dollars of research spent on what is needed to get you to stay in them. And so honestly, the best way to, you know, to avoid it is to just get rid of them. I know that's maybe not necessarily practical in today's world, um, but definitely deleting from your phone and, and things, are, you know, um, can, can help. And, and it's like the other, uh, I think it was just today or yesterday that this happened. I pulled out my phone and I was going to go look at something. And, um, not like a particular thing. It was like, I need to, I need to be doing something. And I found myself like, oh, well my downtime's on for all these other things. I don't even have Facebook on the phone. What is so important that I need to look at? And it was mm -hmm. just a really good self respective, you know, like, like, I don't know. It's a good reflection moment to be like, why do I have this assumption that I constantly yeah. need some sort of sensory input? Can't I, I just be, can't I just be? And so I'll find myself, yeah, go through the same process. I'll be looking at my phone. I'm like, I know that I need to look at something on my phone, but what is yeah, the same what is exact it? thing? Same exact thing. Right. And so it's like right now, I mean, I still have like Twitter and Instagram, but I don't, those aren't really like sit down and scroll forever things for me. Um, I have two people who I like to see if they posted anything recent on Twitter and one person on Instagram who I like to see if he's posted anything. And, um, and that's it. The only other thing other than like, like randomly scrolling blogs or listening to podcasts or whatever is, um, is, is reading. It's like the Kindle app or, yep. or whatever. And I don't like to, to just read books two or three minutes at a time. I don't like to do that. Right. I like to sit down with sessions and especially now take notes. And so, um, yeah. So for me, there's less and less reason just to pull out my phone and look at it for whatever reason. So uh, all that to say prayer, I put my phone away and then, um, uh, just another big honest part of it for me is willpower, just straight up willpower of like, as a responsible adult, as the spiritual leader of my family, I need to be focused on giving my kids and my family the attention that they deserve. I don't have forever with them. And so I must, um, I, I must deal with the reality of life. And part of dealing with the reality of life is just sucking it up, being a man, frankly, and saying my kids are more important than scrolling Facebook. Um, and I, it's, what can I say? It's hard. I mean, right. We are millennials, uh, are not digital natives, but we're dang close. We're dang close to being digital natives. And, and so what that basically means is that we've grown up where digital sensory input was the norm for us growing up. And, um, um, you know, it's even worse for gen, Gen X, Gen Z, not Gen X, Gen Z, and, um, and going forward because, again, like, they don't even know what MapQuest is, right? There was, think about this. They grew up in a world, they have no idea what it's like to live in a world without Google Maps. So many. Without things. guided directions, Crazy. you know? And so it's even harder for them because this is, this is such a, such a big part of their world. And so we don't want to lose that. We want to deal with the realities of the world we live in while still realizing that some things are not. Something should not just be things of the past. They were actually good for us. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to keep those things alive. So that's, that's, that's where we're at. So fun things. It, it takes work to do fun things. I have to set the mood. So I pray, put my phone away, 
and just exercise some serious willpower. Man, for a fun for a fun uh, category, that that we have some serious topics there, Steve. <laughs> I know, but it's, you know, I think a lot of other people would resonate with that, that, yeah, that you know, they're so focused on their work. So, yeah, no, I, yeah, definitely. I agree with you. Um, my final category is I, this will be really quick is my real work, which is my day job that provides money for, uh, me and my family. Yeah. And, yeah. um, so that is, um, it, it's very straightforward. I just, I grind it. Um, mm. kind of like Steve, um, I might have a snack during the day weekends a little bit different but i try to stick to eating one meal a day usually right when i get home because i'm usually starving at that point so um i just i typically don't take a lunch break i don't take a lunch break i just work through lunch and so each day is different depending on what's going on at work but like today was kind of my last day getting a lot of stuff done through some tr transitional stages at my work and so today i put in almost 10 straight hours and just just no wow. break just just grind right through it so that's what I do the second I get into work. Now, sometimes I'll, I usually will listen to music or I'll put on a podcast. Um, so when I work, I can usually focus on those things and do a pretty good job. But yeah, if, for me, it's like, I don't want a lollygag. Yeah. Every once in a while I'll, I'll go around and talk to a couple of coworkers, um, just about whatever, but that's like maybe 15 minutes worth total during the day. It really wow. doesn't add up to, to anything. I get in there. Unfortunately, my office is in a good location where I'm in the back away from everyone. I can focus. And yeah, I just, I just go, it doesn't matter how much I have to get done. I, I get it done all in one sitting. Sometimes it's five hours, sometimes it's 10 hours like today. And sometimes wow. things will come up and it adds more, but yeah, it's, um, that's just how I do it. And I, I do the same thing with like chores at the house. Like Saturday, I usually have a goal of just kind of tidying up the house. And then one big thing I want to get done that just needs to get done and yeah. do that in one sitting too, and just knock it out. Um, so that's kind of on stuff that I don't really, well, I enjoy my job, but stuff that I, is work and I don't really like get super excited about. I just, yeah. I just get to it and I'm like, all right, we're going to start now and I'm not going to stop until it's all done. Cause that's just how yeah. it is. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, for me, when I was doing the, the, you know, you know, kind of clock in clock out full-time job, um, I was same way. I was able to do a lot of like listening to podcasts. I mean, I, I got a straight up college level education, yeah. um, <laughs> honestly, listening to audiobooks and podcasts, yeah. um, while I was working and, um, I, I'm not going to lie. It, my actual work suffered, um, because of that, which I, I sort of. I mean, I don't really have any re regrets necessarily. Um, I just, you know, as some, somebody who like works with other people now, I don't employ people, but I have contractors. I, um, you know, I wouldn't want them working half focused on the job, half not. So I, I kind of, you know, I kind of see things from a little different angle in that regard. Um, so anyway, I, I just, but the work that I was doing was mostly, it was mostly mindless, but I could have been more mindful about it and, and progressed in the career. I just didn't, I just. I just didn't have any interest in it. I yeah. just, gotcha. I just didn't like it at all. I, I didn't want to continue um, doing that. So I focused my energy on how could I get out. And that's, I mean, that's what I did and it worked and I'm thankful for it. Um, so now the only caveat, the only big problem with this is now my work involves a lot of, of thinking. It involves a lot of, um, frankly, pressure. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I have, I have, I have, I, we'll try not to be too specific here, but I have one, one client right now that pays me. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I think I can say this without being too specific. I have one client right now that pays me 1500 more dollars per month than my employer paid me before one client. And, and so that's difficult for me because I have to, I really want to do a fantastic job for this client, just like I want to do a fantastic job for all of my clients, but now it all comes down on, on me. Like the buck stops with me. There's nobody yep. else to blame. I can't send them to the, I can't send yep. them to my boss. You know, my boss is God. Right. And so, and they, you know, that while, while most of the people I work for are, you know, same worldview as me or whatever, they're kind of like, well, you're the one I'm looking at. So you're the responsible party. You know? <laughs> and, um, so it's, it's just, it, it is a lot more pressure, a lot more thinking. And so I do have to now come up with like times to do like intentional learning, listening to podcasts and things like that. I can't really do that while I work now because I can't think very clearly when I'm listening to other people's thoughts. And, um, and so much yeah. of my work right now is thought 
uh, work. Which, which leads me to my first point here, which is that I usually listen to instrumental music, usually movie scores. Um, sometimes I'll do modern hymns, um, like Sovereign mm. Grace music is one of yeah. my favorites, and I'll I'll listen or like City of Light, people like that. I'll listen to them. Um, it's calming for me. Um, obviously, you know, worldview wise and everything, it, it's nice to hear songs about Jesus. Uh, and so it keeps my mind at ease and reminds me that through the pressure, the stress, the anxiety, those things that come with that, it kind of keeps it all in perspective. Um, I do journal. I keep the, I keep the, the notes, uh, for, for my journal handy, uh, all throughout the day, write down important things to help me think through ideas, um, to save important things for later to follow up on and just kind of help keep it all connected. So uh, some people like to call that having a second brain. Um, if that's how you want to put it, that's, that's fine. I kind of see it that way. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of my, my brain on the screen and, um, I, I can kind of keep it organized sometimes a little better than my, my actual brain, I think. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's helpful. Uh, one thing that I'll do along the lines of the, the downtime idea that we talked about a minute ago is I will manage my notifications depending on activity. So for example, Zoom and other apps that I use, like um, I have an app that turns my iPhone into a camera, which is what you're, it, it turns it into a webcam. Um, obviously it has a camera, but, but this, this actually connects to my computer, turns it into a webcam. And so this is what you're seeing me on right now. And I have it set so that when that app opens, all of my devices go into um, Apple's focus mode uh, that I, I created one called meeting slash deep work. And so it, it makes it to where it silences all my notifications, except for the ones from like my wife, basically. Um, and to, it saves them right there for later. I can actually really easily go in and see the notifications that came in while focus was on, but it doesn't interrupt me with those. So I have that, I try to automate, this is a point I didn't even write down, but this leads to that point naturally of, I try to automate as much as possible in my life because it's kind of like those activation triggers. Um, it's like Alexa. We we use. She's probably gonna hear me now. Um, I'll say Lexi. Uh, I'll lay it up. We use we use Lexi, um, all all throughout the house. Probably not a good idea from the censorship and you know China whatever standpoint. But from the standpoint of just um, of making life easier, yeah. I mean, we can we can say often one word and it will set the entire house the way that it needs to be with with lights and you know whatever and different things. Um, and so we tr I try to eliminate and streamline life and work as much as possible, um, by, by doing those things. Um, and then kind of the last point here about what I do while working is that I will manually enter those sort of focus mood sessions if the work is very task oriented. So I, I definitely want to be able to unplug from the stream of notifications if the work that I'm going to be doing could easily be interrupted by that. Um, and it's just the nature of the work that I'm doing right now is such that it's a lot of communication, um, type of work, be it with contractors or with clients. And I just, it's so easy to get interrupted by those things. So I have my, basically my notifications, even for email and stuff is kind of off by default anyway. Um, but, I, but for text messages and everything, I'll go ahead and silence those things so that I can get work done, um, and not be interrupted by those. And it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to get into the rhythm of, I'm still not perfect at it, but some things just deserve to wait. Not everything needs your immediate answer or your immediate input or your immediate feedback. And the more that we develop work cultures that allow us to work that way, asynchronous, you know, most of the time respond when the time is available and not have this assumption of an immediate response. These are all things that help us to get more work done in yep. the same amount of time. And uh, anything like that's very important to me, especially when you're working from home with all these distractions. Uh, my office used to be in the middle of the living room with four kids and three dogs running around. And um, right. So now I've, I've commandeered my, my daughter's, uh, you know, bedroom. She doesn't use it anyway. She's, you know, two. So um, it's now my office and that one thing um, helped. So, yeah, I mean, just little, little things that, that we really try to do to streamline things and, and provide an environment with as much focus as possible, because that's the kind of mindset I need to be in when I'm, when I'm working. So that's what work looks like for me. Awesome. That's cool. Steve. Uh, yeah. if you sure. ever give the office space back to your daughter, um, 
I'll be busy that weekend because I won't feel like helping him move all that. Oh, uh, well, that's good to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mind. That's good to know. I, uh, it, it's, yeah, I, I, and I don't know what will happen. It, yeah, when that, it, when and if that becomes the reality, I don't know where I will go. I don't know if I'll move to the sec to the other area of the basement where the kids' school is now. <laughs> you know, maybe we can send them to school by that point. I don't know. So we'll see what happens with that. I'm interested. I just, I just watched a uh, Seinfeld episode where, um, I forget the specific setup, but essentially Jerry becomes friends with, oh, uh, yeah, it's, um, is it Keith and uh, Keith Anderson, uh, base MLB baseball player. I forget, I forget his name, but, um, he ends up like, uh, um, getting, uh, um, hangs out with them and starts talking with them. And then, uh, he asks, uh, Keith Hernandez, that's his name. And then he asks, uh, he asks Jerry to help him move. And Jerry's like, man, I don't know if we're at that point in our relationship yet. If, uh. He should be asking me to move his stuff. That's a very significant step for the male bond. <laughs> I could see that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. That's cool. Steve, this was a really fun episode. I think. Yeah, um, man, I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's a little bit more casual, relaxing. So uh, sometimes it's good. Everyone's yeah. going to take a break from the serious topics. Um, a little, little more about our stories uh, instead of yeah. just us. Story it's in general. So, and it's and it's always fun to talk talk to each other just about our lives and everything. Now sure. that so, uh, to wrap this episode up, let's move on to our story of the week. Boom, boom. I feel like we need a little audio thing to insert right there for our January of the week. Boom. Uh, yeah, right. We'll just, yeah, make it up every time. Um, I've talked for a while. Uh, would you like to go first? Yeah, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, yes, yeah, so my story of the week, it was really interesting. So I've kind of limited the amount of time that I listen to long form podcasts just because of, of just timing and prioritizing what I listen to, but I came across one that I listened to and I'm still not quite done it, but I'm at the end. Um, are you familiar with Lex Friedman, his podcast? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so he just had a guy on in the last, I think few weeks. Um, his name is Brett Johnson. Um, and it's probably, um, the most it's, it's just an awesome life story that this guy has. So his name is Brett Johnson. The title of the episode on this podcast is U.S. Most Wanted Cyber Criminal. Brett Johnson was a U.S. Most Wanted Cyber Criminal called the original Internet Godfather by U.S. Secret Service for building the first organized cybercrime community called Shadow Crew, which was the precursor to today's Darknet and Darknet markets. Um, wow. And this guy, what really is great about it is, um, you know, people might think of, you know, cyber tech people as kind of geeky or, you know, kind of, you know, live in your mom's basement, but this guy present let just, you know, we talk a lot about marketing yourself. Um, this guy, um, it just presents himself so well. Um, and he actually, um, I think it was in high school. He said, I don't know how this works. And he didn't go into detail about it. I'm curious, but he said when he was in high school, I guess I was in the seventies, maybe early eighties, he got, um, he received in the state of Kentucky, I think it was Kentucky, the, um, the best, um, actor award for like, um, like theater in his high school. And I don't know how, but the best actress award as well. So I don't know how that works, but he received both of them in the same year. What? So I'm not sure how that works, but he, um, but yeah, he likes theater and stuff, but he just really conversational. So anyway, just how he presents himself makes his story all the better. And he talks about his childhood, how right from the beginning the get go, just in the, the household he was with and how his mom was, he got into crime right away and how he was making, ripping people off and making millions of dollars and just, um, and how, wow. and how he got out of that and setting up the whole cyber crime thing. And what was really fascinating about it is not just his like specific stuff, but he would, I had to pause and like rewind a couple areas so I could focus, but he goes into detail on how like early credit card. Um, fraud work where I didn't know this, but you could actually back then, I don't think you do it now, but back then in the early thousands, you could actually, um, make fraudulent credit cards, not stolen, but fraudulent ones, just whole cloth and have them work, um, which yes. is just incredible. And so, um, one of the more interesting podcasts that I have heard in a long time. So yeah, um, the Lex Friedman podcast is on Spotify and YouTube and it's the, uh, episode on Brett Johnson, episode number 272. It was fantastic. Sweet, sweet. I'll check that out for sure. Um, yeah, so so mine, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay out of the political end of it, but but mine is about this this recent thing that happened where um, 
the and it hasn't passed yet. I don't well, I don't it might have. Um it might actually have passed both the um Senate and the House. But um as of today, there was at least a bill that was sort of going through uh, in the process of going through in Florida that would strip Disney of some special privileges and things that it, that it has. And again, I'm going to say out of the politics of it, I just thought the story itself was interesting because a lot of people don't know um, that Disney in Florida since 1967 has actually been able to operate somewhat independently from the government. In other words, they were actually given the jurisdiction um, as like a, as like their own county. And it's called the Reedy, Reedy Creek Improvement District. And the, I think it's the Reedy Creek Tax Act or Improvement Act, I can't remember, um, that, um, that, that was given to them. And, and right, I mean, the idea was that Florida at the time, it's actually interesting. Like, so, so the, the land was perfect for Disney to move there. Um, the area was, was, was perfect. It was, you know, pretty easily accessible for a good number of people in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. And so they wanted to come to Florida, but Florida's infrastructure at the time, their governmental infrastructure could not support mm. what Disney needed. And so they were given special, um, special, uh, governmental in a sense, privileges, uh, special tax, um, exemptions and self-governance, um, uh, abilities that, uh, set them apart. And those have been active since 1967 and they allowed uh, Walt Disney World to become the Walt Disney World that it is today. I mean, part of that definitely made it possible for them to see, again, special breaks and not have to pay out extra monies and things. But also the, the taxpayers of Florida wouldn't, wouldn't shoulder a lot of those burdens because Disney was allowed to take care of all of that privately. And um, like I said, trying to stay out of the politics, but basically, to put it lightly, um, Disney pissed off the governor of Florida and he said... We're not going to take it anymore. And rather than just let things keep going how they were and playing defense, he decided to play offense probably for once in the Republican, uh, you know, whatever card. Usually they don't play offense. And um, he decided he was going to play offense. And he said, we see what you're doing. We don't like it. And so we're taking this away from you. So it is expected, if it hasn't passed, it's expected to pass. And he's already said that he would sign it into law that basically strips Disney of these special privileges that they, that they have. And um, it's actually, believe it or not, um, it's, it's for me, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, why? Well, uh, you know, worldview level, I, you know, broadly speaking, I'm sure I don't agree with everything, but I, you know, I broadly agree with, 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 uh, Ron DeSantis and, and a lot of the decisions that he's made over the past few years, you know, I'm broadly in worldview agreement with him at the same time, I am a freaking huge Disney fan. And like, I, <laughs> I, I was nerdy enough to know about the Reedy Creek Improvement District before this, like, I'm telling you the story because I'm, I'm just assuming that most people don't actually know this, but I knew this. Um, and it's a, it's a cool part. I think of Disney history and I'm all about industry. And I mean, I'm, you know, the whole visionary thing like Walt, I mean, I think it's the, I think it's just a really cool thing. I, I'm a Walt fan. I'm an Elon fan. I'm a, I'm a Steve Jobs fan. You know, I, I'm into that kind of thing. And so I think it was a really cool point in, in the development of Disney and in their history that they had this. And so in that sense, I'm sad to actually see it, uh, see it go just because it's an important part of Disney history and, and how, how Walt Disney World, a place that helped form a lot of my childhood memories, et cetera, was built. It's been interesting to see reactions to this. I mean, you've got some people saying things like, oh, Florida's going to pull, you look at this, they're going to pull their, or Disney's going to pull their operations out of Florida. I mean, okay, I'm not going to pretend to know everything and I could always be proven wrong, but give me a break. Um, if you know anything about how invested Disney is in Florida, it would be, I think, a literal impossible task to uproot their Florida operations yeah. and say and say we're we're leaving. Like you, you, anyone who says this, I don't think is possibly aware of how invested in Florida Disney is. Um, it, I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible for them to shut down Florida operations and survive. Um, or, or move. And I don't, frankly, I don't think DeSantis is an idiot. So I don't think that he would do this knowing that it was going to cost Disney to pull out because I, I, I just financially, it's not even, 
that big of an impact in terms of being worth it for them to pull out. So just some interesting stuff that's going on. You know, it's fascinating to me. Does this mean that uh, Florida will have a little bit more ownership even like over like the roads and stuff? Like going like yes. this? To, so yes. Yeah. So anyone traveling to Disney over the next couple of years, just be aware that the road conditions might be a little bit worse. Uh, yes, that's going true. And, and again, I am not like a big guy. Like I'm not big on like knowing how all this stuff works. And so it is my, I think it's, I think it's true that now a lot of the tax burden and things will fall onto the people of Florida in, in, in at least some respect that right. it didn't before. And so like, they're going to have to figure out how to actually care for the roads and yeah. for things like that. Now, maybe it'll create jobs. You know, I, again, I'm not sure how, how all those things are going to shake out because I haven't looked into it enough. I just thought the story itself was kind of was kind of yeah, interesting. Interesting, sort of a big yeah. moment in Disney history that's kind of like, you know, being undone. So anyway, definitely. Well, yeah. Steve, this has been a a great podcast good. episode. Yeah, it man. Good. I'll look forward to the good. next one. Setting the mood, yes, sir. All right. Um, well, God bless you guys. I appreciate the downloads and appreciate the listens. Again, over 120. Ah, it's so exciting. Um, let's keep it up. Tell your friends. Share. Take a screenshot of the podcast and let other people know about it. Share it on your social media and stuff. And uh, But don't overuse that social media. Uh, but uh, but share it. Share it out there. And I think it's going to be fun. So um, as we continue into the future. All right. So God bless. You guys take care. Yeah. Alex, see you later, man. See ya.